Well, you said out of all the movies out there, Goodfellas and Donnie Brasco, those are the most authentic mafia movies. I would say Goodfellas, yeah, fairly accurate. I knew all those guys. Okay. Um, it was depicted well. Donnie Brasco, like I said, they took the dramatic liberty there, but it was it was pretty accurate. Casino is actually my favorite movie out of yeah, the Yeah, I like Casino. Casino was but, good. But not, not accurate. Not really. Not really. <laughs> and you said Sopranos is completely inaccurate. If a mob boss was ever visiting a psychiatrist, he'd be in the trunk of his car by the end of the week, okay. along with the psychiatrist. I'll tell you what I think the best. <laughs> I'll tell you what I think the best mob movie, one of the best. It's it, it's not as notable because it, it wasn't a, uh, a theatrical release, but the HBO movie Gotti, where Armand Desanti played Gotti, hmm. I thought that was brilliantly done. Extremely, it was about as accurate a movie as you're going to see on that life. Certainly on that story. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you haven't, go on HBO, go and watch it. It was great. Great movie. Our son, our son, everybody was, was terrific in that movie. Well, there was actually a movie about your life. Uh, a documentary. Documentary. Yeah. Right. Uh, we're in talks now to make a movie. I've always been kind of resistant of it, but maybe the timing is right now. Okay. And you've done a bunch of books as well. Yes. You know, as the only high-ranking member of one of the five families who's out there talking about it, writing books about it, doing documentaries about it. Any sort of backlash from any of your former associates or, or people who are currently, I mean, does the Colombo family still exist, number one? It does, yes. It does? Yes. So how does the Colombo family feel about you right now? You know, bottom line is I never put anybody in prison. And they knew that that's not what I was about. Did they like the fact that I walked away? No. Did they like the fact that I'm talking about it? No. Do people say, oh, he's a rat, he's this, he's that? You get that section of people that do that. You know, half the people that talk about rats, they don't even know what a rat is or really what, what it's all about. They just try to talk and act tough. Um, but there are a lot of people that support what I've done. I've never had a run-in with anybody. Nobody's ever approached me directly and said, hey, this and that. Yeah, sometimes online people will make a remark. I, that doesn't bother me. Okay. Um, again, bottom line is I never hurt anybody, and that was very significant to everybody. Okay. Are you familiar with the Takashi 69 case that's going on right now? Not really, no. It's a rapper out of New York with rainbow hair. I, I know who he is, but I don't know the case. Right. Yeah. Well, he, he got arrested, I guess, him and his whole crew got arrested under the RICO. Hmm. And uh, he had nine, nine charges mm -hmm. against him. And he is currently, you know, we actually had his guilty plea paperwork where he is agreeing to cooperate hmm. with all law enforcement against all of his co-defendants. Wow. Some of these co-defendants were actually, you know, like some of the interesting things about this case is there was a video of him essentially putting a hit out on somebody, mm. telling a guy, I'll, I'll give you twenty or 30000 to go handle that. And then that guy get, as, ends up getting shot at shortly afterwards. He's, he ended up testifying against that guy as well. Wow. And the government, you know, based on the paperwork, is that if he completely cooperates, they're not going to prosecute on all nine charges. Do you see this type of thing happen? Absolutely. I mean, look, I, you know, I got to be honest with you. Let's take Gotti's case and let's take Sammy the Bull. Yeah. Sammy admitted to 19 murders. He admitted to 19 murders. Right. In my view, how do you give a guy that is basically a serial murderer by his own admission, how do you give him a pass? Right. Because he testified against John Gotti, who had a bigger name, who they wanted to get, who beat them a couple of times. But look, John, John Gotti, in my opinion, on his worst day, was a, as good or better a guy than Sammy the Bull. Sammy just wasn't as flamboyant. He didn't thumb his nose in the government's face. So how does a, a civilized government make a deal with a guy like that and put him back on the street? What happens when he comes out? Goes into an ecstasy ring and starts selling right, yeah. ecstasy. Right, yeah. He got, he got caught with a drug ring, yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you justify that? And I got, I'm, I'm not, nothing personal against Sammy at all. Did you know Sammy? Yeah, nothing personal. But how does the government, take Sammy or anybody else, how does the government make a deal with somebody like that and put him back out on the street? Go get him, fight the case, do whatever. But to make the kind of deals that they're making, you know, I mean, it doesn't work for me. I'm sorry. Right, so Sammy ultimately, I, I just looked it up, in 2002 he's convicted of the drug ring mm -hmm. and given uh, 15, years, to, right? 15 to 17 yeah. years. He was released. In he just got out about a year Just ago. got out in 2017. So yeah. he's still out there, he's 74 years old. Yeah. 
Did it surprise you when he uh, turned on everybody like that? You know, yes and no, because guys were starting to flip left and right. And I said, well, there's just another one going down. It's like I said, you know, nobody wants to do 100 years in prison. Yeah. I don't care who they are. <clears throat> Unless you're Sonny Francis, my dad, who will do 1,000 years before he would cooperate. And he's the only guy I know that I can say without any shadow of a doubt that my dad would never, ever, ever cooperate. Well, I mean, that's basically what happened you know, with the Takashi situation is that they wanted the other guys who were more hardened criminals. This guy was kind of young. I think he was like 20 years old or 19 years old. The other guys actually had long criminal records and mm -hmm. were like the quote unquote real gangsters of mm -hmm. that crew. So they're using him to put everybody away. But it's a very strange situation because a lot of them were doing crimes on this guy's behalf to work out his various rap beefs and, and so forth. And then I, I got to tell you, I speak to a lot of young people. You know, it's part of the ministry that I have. And I, I speak to gangbangers all the time. I go into detention centers and I tell them straight out, let me give you some good advice if you want to be a criminal, you want to stay on the street. You're going to do something, do it alone. That's it. That's it. I mean, nobody can snitch on you later on. I said, because your best friend, you know, that's going to go to war with you during your criminal activity, watch what happens when they get him in the room alone. They say, hey, you know what, you either can go away the rest of your life for the next 40, 50 years, because you don't get parole anymore. You're doing 85%. Hmm. You get 50, you're doing 40 and change. Okay, either that or talk to us. We'll help you out, we'll give you a new identity. That guy's going away forever anyway, don't worry about it. And at least you'll preserve your life. See how friendly he is with you at that point. Right, well I interviewed Freeway Ricky Ross, who mm -hmm. was one of the biggest drug dealers right. on the West Coast. His plug, you know, his drug connect, ended up being an informant and took the stand and helped him to get a life sentence. Mm -hmm. And when I asked him what would happen if, if this guy walked in, Louis Blandone, I think was the guy's name, he said, absolutely nothing. What would happen if he walked in the room right now? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I have absolutely nothing against him. Really? No. Nah. It wasn't his fault. See, the way I look at it is, first of all, I made the mistake of getting in the drug business. That was my first mistake. Mm -hmm. My next mistake was I went back into the drug business as I said I quit. Yeah. So what he did is he only did what people do in the drug business. They tell. They set you up. Hmm. And for somebody to go into the drug business and not understand that, which I was in the drug business and didn't understand it, mm -hmm. um, but I came to grips with it. Is that really the reality of a life of crime from your point of view that telling and snitching is just part of it? So if you're going to get into it, just realize that's what it is? I, I believe so. You know, I, I had a similar circumstances. The fellow that snitched on me was my partner in the gas business. We created the scheme together. He was, uh, he was six foot four, almost 500 pounds, huge guy. We worked together for seven years. We never had a problem between us. We got very close. My kids called him Uncle Larry, his kids called me Uncle Michael, our wives knew each other, we were close. When he snitched, you know, people told me on the street, listen, we'll take care of this for you or you can take care of it, but the guy's got to go. And I said, no, it's okay. I said, I knew at some point in time he might be weak. I understood what, what I was up against. I said, I know his wife and kids. I mean, you know, I'll fight him in court. And so that's how I felt too. And you know, he ended up he ended up testifying against me. That's the reason I went to jail, basically, in the case. And what happened with him? Okay, they let him out. He goes back into the gas business in Texas. He gets caught, <laughs> puts his whole family in trouble. He got 20 years. Hmm. They put him back in jail. So things, you know, but it's it's part of the business. You know, it's going to happen. You don't want it to happen. You try to avoid it. You try to be careful, but it's going to happen.